Good morning and we welcome all those who are watching our service today on YouTube from many parts of the world and we pray that you will enjoy uh, worshipping together with us this morning. But before I, uh, before we continue our service, I just have a few notices that I would like to share with you. We, we ask you to continue praying for all those in our church families struggling from sickness, poor health and other problems. We think especially of Jeff and Sir Edwin, Jeanette, Yvette, Dion, Brenda, Val, and so many others. And uh, Father, we also and we also ask you all not to forget to follow all these COVID pan pandemic protocols to protect both yourselves and also those around you. And also we pray for our brethren up in in uh, Central Africa folk in Malawi, in Mozambique, in Madagascar, Cyclone uh, uh, Honor um, has uh, dumped so much water that um, there have been tremendous floods up in the, both those three countries. So we just pray that the flood waters will recede quickly and that people can resume their normal lives once again. And then our verse for the week comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we read verses 16 and 17. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I'm going to hand over now to Pat for our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our countless blessings. We thank you not only for the food we have to eat, lovingly prepared, but also for so many other gifts, in particular the loved ones we cherish dearly, a comfortable place to live, the beauty that surrounds us, health and spiritual wealth, to name just a few. We acknowledge you for these countless blessings you have provided. We thank you for giving us clear direction through your holy word. Through good and bad times, help us to see that we are blessed beyond measure. Father, we thank you for every life that has been born from above, and is now in union with Christ Jesus, our Head and our Saviour. Guard and guide each one. Protect their hearts and minds from deceit and lies that only come from the devil. He is the father of all lies, the great deceiver of men's souls, and the murderer from the beginning. Guide each one, we pray, into the way of truth. Give them wisdom and sound judgment to recognize gross injustice, wickedness, and sin. Into your hands we place each child of God both near and far, and play protection over their lives. Give them discernment to choose the good and reject the evil. And may each one come to a deeper knowledge of your Son, Jesus, and develop a thirst to know you more and more, individually as believers and collectively as the Church of Christ. We pray that all you purpose for each of your children may be accomplished in their lives. To your praise and your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. We pray for our leaders, both in the private and public sector and in the church. We pray especially for our healthcare workers and our professionals, for our teachers, for our farmers, for those in the service industry, for all who make such a wonderful difference in the lives they lead. Without these people, <coughs> life on earth would be a real struggle. We pray this, pray this in the precious name and blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everybody. The first reading comes from Exodus 2, 1 to 10, the birth of Moses. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it, 
put it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the child went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and, became, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. The second reading is from Acts 7, 20-29. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as his own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. And Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. This is the word of God. <laughs> Thank you, Salman. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this word spoken this morning, Lord God. We pray that the words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart, will be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord God, who shows us the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand, pleasures forevermore. Bless the ears, Lord God, he that is, has an ear, let him hear. Open the hearts of your people here, Lord God, to receive what the Lord has in store for them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Greetings to everybody in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you to Thelma for helping us out there with the reading. And to Mark 2, Mark's going to put another passage of Scripture out for me, which I'm going to be outlaying our Scripture from. So, um, we're looking at the story of Moses, and if you just look at the timeline, I think he was about 1,500 years before, before Christ, and another 2,000 years onto that. It's a good 3,500 year time period away from where we stand, but yet we can still go to the life and times of Moses and see how we can apply it into our lives and what it means for us all these many years later. For don't we know what 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that all scripture is inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So we pray that we would be thoroughly furnished as we are read up in this word. So if we look at Hebrews chapter 11, I think it's from verse 23, and there's four things that I want to highlight and um no it's no it's okay no it's fine it's fine mark's promised me he's going to put up on the board um there's four things i want to highlight so the title of the sermon is the four p's of moses i even googled the four p's of moses before i came up with that sermon and nobody had taken it so i thought well that's a little bit of a originality so 
Nevertheless, so if we look at Hebrews chapter 11, um, I've taken it from the King James Bible to get my four Ps. It says there, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Well, you know, it's interesting that he was born at a time when Pharaoh commanded the midwives to kill the Jewish babies. But it tells us that his parents, they did not fear and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And they reared this child. And it gets him to being about three months old where it seems as if he's weaned from his mother and it becomes a difficult task to hide him. So she makes a basket for him and puts him amongst the bulrushes. You know, what we find difficult to hide, you know, you can run but you can't hide. What God does is amazing because in the next 40 years, God hides Moses in Pharaoh's palace, right underneath Pharaoh's nose. And Pharaoh's daughter finds him up in verse 6 of Exodus chapter 2. She pulled the child and she lifted him up out of the basket. And she said a Hebrew child. And the reason why she knew it was a Hebrew child and not an Egyptian child is that the child was circumcised. And that was the mark that Moses lived with all his days. Every time he urinated, he knew he was different to the Egyptian boys. And it's like that with you and me. We circumcised of the heart. And every time we sin, and every time we do something wrong, we reminded of the goodness of the Lord, and His blessings, and His flavor. So it tells us that God hides Him. You see, Psalm 91 verse 1 says, They that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, right under the nose of Pharaoh. You know what Pharaoh did here, drowning those boys, is what happened to Pharaoh and his army 80 years later. When this Moses, whose name means to be drawn out of water, him and the Israelites were drawn out of water. They were drawn out of the Red Sea and brought into the wilderness. And the Egyptian army, the contemporaries that Moses had grew up with in his first 40 years, had drowned in the Red Sea. And we've got to be drawn out. God's got to draw us out. Unless God calls us, we won't come. Queen Esther was told by, by Mordecai, says, unless King Azurus calls you, don't go. We've got to be drawn out and placed into the body of Christ. Where it speaks about the one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5. We're going to be baptized into Christ. It's peculiar that those that crossed on dry land is a type of baptism, but those that went through the Red Sea in the water drowned. So we have this picture here and it tells us that he was a proper child. He was a beautiful child. And his parents raised him up at such difficult times. Not knowing whether the cry of the child would alarm a neighbor or somebody. And that they would come and they would remove the child and kill him. Such was the days in which Moses grew up. But God has a plan and a purpose for all our lives. Because we are created in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. We need to remind ourselves that. That's why the devil hates us so much. You know, when I think of a proper child, I think of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1 5, it tells us, God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came forth from your mother's womb, I sanctified you. And I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. Before he was formed. God knew him. The psalmist in Psalm 139 says, Thou hast searched me, and thou hast known me. He says, You know my down sitting and my uprising. 
Excuse me. He says, you understand my thoughts are far off. He goes on and says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your ways are too marvelous and past finding out. Prior to that, he says that you knit me together in my mother's womb. You knit me, you sewed me together in my mother's womb. He created them male and female alike. The difference between the male and the female is in the chromosomes. We all share 22 pairs of chromosomes, but the 23rd pair, the females have the double X and the men have the XY. And I don't know how many sex changes you need to go for. But you can't change the DNA and the chromosomes of how you were created. Because you were created marvelous, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, of Paul, Jesus said in Acts 9, 15 and 16, on the road to Damascus, he said to Paul, you are my chosen vessel to preach unto the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. But I must needs show you what you must suffer for my name's sake. He was a chosen vessel. If I look at this vase behind me that my wife very kindly did for us, thank you Renee, and the flowers. But we were trying to put it in picture with a camera and we were worried about the shininess and how it would reflect. And I want to tell you a story of this rich merchant that came into town the one time and he walked into the shopkeeper's store who specialized in vases and he had every vase that you could imagine he had a golden vase and a silver vase and one probably like that and one arrayed with precious stones and he had wood vases and pottery vases and all sorts and this rich merchant stopped and he looked at this broken pottery vase on the bottom shelf and he said to the shopkeeper I'll take that one and the shopkeeper was amused and he said why with all your money and your wealth why would you want to take this one and the rich merchant said because when I pour my spirit into the gold one you're not going to see it you're going to see the gold one you're not going to see this these flowers for the shiny shininess of the vase if I put it into the one of the precious stones you're going to be counting the precious stones and mesmerizing how valuable the vase is but when I take an old broken pottery vase with holes in it as I pour my Holy Spirit into it so it shall pour out into others Let your work so shine before men, so that when they see them, they shall glorify the Father which art in heaven. There's three things we've got to make sure that our vase isn't filled with. The first thing is, don't let your vase be filled with yourself. Me, myself and I, the three most important people. Don't let it be filled with yourself. Don't let it be filled with sin. And don't let it be filled with the will. We need to have our vases, as 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says. Now we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power be of God and not of us. When people look at us, they're going to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. If they see in you, if the first thing people see is you, the image and likeness of you, and not Christ. You know, Psalm 51, David wrote and he said, the sacrifices of God are a, a contrite and a broken spirit. Because those are the things that the Lord can associate with. The Lord is busy 
with two things. He's there to afflict the comfortable and he's there to comfort the afflicted. Right now, either you are comfortable or you're afflicted. If you're afflicted, you'll be comfortable. Comforted. Comforted. And if you're comfortable, you're going to be afflicted. So we read of Train up a child in the ways of the Lord, Proverbs 22, verse 6, and when he is old, he shall not depart. And here we have Moses' own mother, who his sister Miriam called and said, Come. And the passage in Exodus 2 tells us that even Pharaoh's daughter gave her a wage. She said, Look after my child, which was actually her child, Jochebed's child, and I'll even pay you. And she became this nursery nanny. And though Moses was skilled in the ways of the Egyptian and all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he spoke the Egyptian language, and he dressed the Egyptian clothes, and he went to the Egyptian school, and he studied the Egyptian science and astrology and astronomy, and he worshipped, and they went to the Egyptian temple and they worshipped the Egyptian gods. He knew it was different to the Egyptians, was he of his circumcision and being trained up in the ways of the Lord by his mother and at night time and his mother had him to herself she would speak to Moses about Adam and Eve and the origin of sin and mention Enoch and Noah and then she told him about Abraham Isaac and Jacob and the twelve sons of Jacob And he learned all those things. Repeatedly she prayed for him. You know, she gave Moses to God. And God returned 100 fold. Because what you cast your bread upon the waters after many days, it will come back to you. And her son would be the leader. And he would lead Israel. He would be a man, it was called, he was the most meekest man on the earth. The treasure in this earthen vessel. He was given the Ten Commandments to give to the people. He led the people. When he found those two Jews in altercation, he said to them, why are you fighting brother against brother? They said to him, when he was 40 years old, they said to him, who has made you ruler and judge over us? And 40 years later, God would make him ruler and judge over them. And he would lead them out. My name is Moses. I've been drawn out of the water. And I'm going to draw you out of the water. Out of the Red Sea. Onward to the promised land. So marvelous are the ways of God. They are past finding out. Thank you that they are recorded for us. That we can regurgitate the story so many thousands of years later and still apply it into our lives. So, fathers, mothers, are you training up your child in the ways of the Lord so that when they are old, and it doesn't matter if they're a Daniel, a Shadrach, a Meshach, an Abednego, if they land up in exile in Babylon, but they'll not take up the king's delicacies and they'll still worship the true God. By faith, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He gave up the title, the prince of Egypt. There was an animation series. The prince of Egypt, the story of Moses. He gave up the title and the title deeds and everything that came with it. It tells us so that he could esteem, verse 26, esteem the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And boy, were there treasures in Egypt. In those pyramids, those vaults, full. And here he is, essentially the firstborn son of Pharaoh's daughter. And had he not taken up his mantle and his calling, he would have suffered death at the tenth plague which came upon all the first war. 
Because he listened to the true God. And it tells us he gave up to being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Just a modern day story which happened a year or so ago was we know about Prince Harry. How he gave up his royal responsibilities, if I can say, without offense, just from what I read in the publications. And I'm just trying to highlight the fact that there are too many Christians today that are giving up their royal duties. They called to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because Paul wrote about Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 and he said, And Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. When you looked at the vase of Demas, you saw the world. It sucked him in. It pulled him in. Into the miry clay. Into the quagmire. I remember Lot who looked with his eyes and saw the green grass of Sodom. And the difference between him and his uncle Abraham was that Abraham was a man that walked by faith and not by sight. He said to Lot, if you want to take the right, I'll take the left. You want to take the east, I'll take the west. Because he esteemed the things of Christ greater than the treasures of Sodom. But Lot was a man that didn't walk by faith, he walked by sight. And he thought it was always greener on the other side. What's in it for me? Me, myself and I. My treasure. How can I make me into a better me? A richer me. A wealthy me. So my eyes are focused not on God. But on the things of this world. Which will sink us. Like sinking sin. Pharaoh's daughter, had he stayed, he could have been the next Pharaoh. He was heir to the throne. He lived in a palace for 40 years. He never knew what it was like to fend for himself. Everything was laid on. Best education. Best tutors. Best clothing. Best latest whatever the fad was. He got it. But it came in a time in his life when he realized, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm born in this world, but I'm not of this world. And you know, for the next 40 years, he would go through the harshest terrain, through the deserts of Midian. And he would be looking after sheep and goats. But God's word reminds us, he says, if you're faithful with a little, I will give you much. And he was faithful with a little. He knew where to find the water and the food for his flocks and bring them to safety. He knew how to fend off wild animals and snakes. He knew how to follow birds for where they were heading and what they would, which birds would show him where the water is. And he got to know that terrain so well that at 80 years old, when God was looking for a man, to lead Israel in, through the wilderness into the promised land, he chose Moses. Because Moses knew that place like a back of his hand. It was his apprenticeship. Coming from the palace, going to this arid wilderness, dry land. It tells us further. That he, he chose rather, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He was like what Ruth said to Naomi. Where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. He knew 
The Israelites were his people. He knew it beforehand. He thought they would realize it when he said to their brothers, why are you fighting? Don't you know God is raising me up to lead you out? But they rejected him. Just like Joseph was initially rejected of his brothers and then later received. The same thing happened to Moses. Rejected first by his brethren and then later received. And the same thing with Jesus Christ. Rejected first of his brethren, but then later shall be received at the second coming. It tells us that he was willing to suffer the affliction of his people. Romans 12, 15 says, When you weep, I will weep. When you rejoice, I will rejoice. There's too many people out there that have it the other way around. When you weep, they rejoice. And when you rejoice, they weep. We need to weep with those that are weeping and comforting. For that's what God would want us to do. Because that's what God is doing. He afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. And rejoice with those that rejoice. Who rejoiced with Moses' parents when they had the child, when they had a hiding in the secret place of the Most High? Until God said, you know what? I've got a better hiding place. We'll just put him in the palace. It tells us that he would rather choose to suffer the affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The pleasures of sin. Because Moses grew up and he saw sin on every corner. He was like Lot in Sodom that was vexed. The Bible calls him just Lot. And Lot was delivered. And here with Moses, it tells us, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, it says, Know this also, that in the latter days, in the last days, in our days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that do good, traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of them Thereby, he says, stay away from these people. And Moses chose to stay away from these people. Because the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful about all things. Who can know it? And the same sin that we see today, Moses saw in his time and Lot saw in Sodom. It starts when it says they were lovers of their own selves. They used to worship their own selves as gods. If Moses did not follow the way of God, Psalm 16 verse 11 says, Thou shalt show me the pathway of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand of pleasures evermore. If he did not take his mantle and follow God, they would have worshipped him and deified him as a God. Because he was the Prince of Egypt. Lovers of their own selves. We live in a time now where we're the most photographed selfie generation on the planet. There's more, more photographs been taken about us in our generation now than ever in the world. It starts off and it says lovers of their own selves and it ends lovers of pleasures and there's 18 that are listed in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 18, I'm reminded in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, and it says, And the number of a beast is the number of the man of 666. 18, 6 plus 6 plus 6, 18. It's the fruit of the Antichrist. This Antichrist spirit that is worshipping itself. Romans 1 ends and tells us that not only do they 
partake in sin, but they actually enjoy doing it. And we are living at such a time. And we've got to decide for ourselves, are we going to suffer and choose to suffer with the affliction of God's people? Or are we going to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? Because it's only a season, but eternity is for a lifetime. Moses, the same Moses in Jude 9, that the devil and Michael contended for his body after he died. Because the devil wanted to resurrect him and lead Israel astray. And Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. And what the devil was unsuccessful with Moses in Jude 9, he's going to do with the Antichrist. Because in Revelation 3.13 tells us that the Antichrist takes a fatal wound to the head. But the Antichrist is going to raise him up and counterfeit resurrection. And he's going to lead Israel to worship. This is the great delusion. Satan, embodied in the Antichrist, in the temple of God. But a remnant who did what Moses did all those many years ago shall flee. And Matthew 24 tells us pray that it's not the Sabbath. And pray that you're not pregnant. Pray not the Sabbath, because he's speaking to the Jews. He's speaking to Israel. So it goes on, esteeming the approach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He did not fear the wrath of the king. Do not fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We do not have to fear the pestilence that walks in the day, dark. Though a thousand fall by our right side and ten thousand by our left side, we shall not fear. Because God is with us. And if He is with us, who can be against us? For He endured as seeing Him who is invisible. Through faith He kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, lest He that destroyed the firstborn, should touch them. The Passover. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do was drowned. Because as you judge, so shall you be judged, meat for meat. And they were taken out. So I cry out to you today, BCC, That you will consider Moses and the story of the vase. And knowing it's that the treasure in us, the coming to church, the raising up the young in the word of the Lord. So that when they are old, they'll not depart. They'll choose to come to church and to choose to be afflicted with, the, with those that are comforted by God. We have this treasure. Let the treasure be seen. Shine your gifts before men. So that they will bring glory to God. Whatever you do in word or deed. Whatever you find yourself to do. And I'm closing with this. Somebody once said, the meaning of life is to find your gift. And the purpose of life is to give it away. The meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. What we find ourselves to do is how we work that gift. Whatever you find yourself to do in word and deed, do all unto the glory of the Lord, and He'll work that gift in you. And the purpose of life is to give it away. The purpose of life is to be like that broken vase with holes in it. So when the Holy Spirit pours Himself into us, 
we can pour out into others like you and me. God bless you and thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Alistair, for a very encouraging uh, message. Um, it's a different uh, take that we had on Moses, uh, the four Bs. But um, yeah, indeed, it's, uh, it's an amazing period uh, in the Old Testament. And the Jewish people are very fortunate to have had Moses to guide them through those difficult times. And now as we go out into the world, accept the blessing. May God the Father bless you, Christ take care of you, the Holy Spirit enlighten you all the days of your life, and the Lord be your defender of body and soul, both now and forever. Amen.